<laughs> That'll be a good blooper. <laughs> Are you like why? <laughs> is it hot in here? Hi, I'm Brandon Garnis, and this is my wife, Julie. We have been married 10 years, and it has been a wonderful 10 years so far. A big part of it is trust. Um, trust really makes it successful because I ruined that trust early on in our marriage and being able to you know work with some of my faults early on in our marriage and just really allowing myself to trust in God fully so that in turn it can really make our relationship be solely you know on trust and just being able to adapt to each other's differences because we come from completely different backgrounds. Yeah, that's a big thing is we are both so different and we're brought up so differently, saw so many different relationships um, as examples and we really had to adapt to each other and just accept who we were. You have to just be able to work with each other because you're two different people. You both do things completely different and so you just have to learn to trust fully in them and keep God the center of everything you do no matter yes. what. Um, we have a lot of fun and we joke around mm -hmm. That's a, yeah. and we laugh a lot. <laughs> yeah, laughter's good. Mm -hmm. One of our conflicts is our differences in love languages. We both show each other, we love each other in different ways and um, I, I receive love by acts of kindness and when Brandon sets a time aside for me, I feel loved. Um, he feels love with physical touch, like a lot. Sometimes I just like go in to hold his hand and then he's like, ooh, <laughs> yeah. And it's just so weird. <laughs> She's my wife. I mean, you know, you're <laughs> supposed to do that. I mean, we're men. Yeah, but just sometimes we don't agree on the time in place. So that's a conflict. We're pretty good at um, keeping everything, all of our feelings and what's going on in our in our lives on the table all the time for both to see. And so our conflicts are never really built up. It's like we handle them daily. And then we just learn to, you know, forgive quickly. Um, we don't let it just sit there and dwell and get heated to where we bring up um, conflicts of the past. Um, you know, we deal with the conflict that is the issue at the moment. Sometimes after a long morning and that's stressful and our, we're running late and um, it's been a hard morning with the kids or whatever, Brandon will call me. It's happened several times and we'll actually pray over the phone. Um, it just, when you go to God, it helps you stay level-headed and it reminds you that we're not in this alone, that God's right there and, and He helps us with our conflict. I want them to know something that comes from my heart, something that I learned early on in our marriage. Um, early on, for some reason, and it's probably issues that I have from my past, but I would belittle Brandon in front of my family and in front of my friends. And I think that my advice to couples would be to be so careful with your words. And you can make or break your spouse with simply by the words you use and the things that you say to them. And um, when, when we're in a heated conversation, yes, I wanna say things that are mean and hurtful, but I have to remember, are those words, are those things that I'm saying to him or want to say to him, more important than who he is. No, they're not. And I think that's something that we can all use in our relationships. And another thing is, you know, that's very important for, I think for couples is to be your spouse's biggest fan. You know, always just give them those words and stuff that they need to hear um, and just let them know that, you know, you're always there for them and you love them. I mean, it's because just those little simple things on a daily basis and stuff really can help, you know, a relationship grow to the level that it needs to, that it needs to grow. Hey, well, obviously, we are continuing our series on families, uh, for better or worse. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 5. Uh, Proverbs, chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 18 and 19. Uh, 
If you don't have a Bible with you, there's some in the pew that look a lot like this. Just grab one of those, turn to page 673, you'll find uh, Proverbs 5. And if you need a Bible, take it with you. We want you to have the Word of God and let it be part of your life. Hey, this is a, a marriage and family series, and, uh, and I want to kind of mention a, a couple of things leading into the message. Uh, first of all, uh, because it's a marriage series, uh, we're going to probably have some recurring themes, kind of like the Bible does. You notice that God tells us more than once that we're to love one another? Uh, he does that because we don't get it the first time. And, and so sometimes uh, we need to kind of hear it again and again and again so we go, oh, God wants us to actually love each other. And it's kind of that way in this. There's a lot of, of patterns that fit no matter what the issue is on marriage. Last week, Pastor O.C. talked about commitment, and today I get to talk about intimacy, uh, which is just a nice way of saying talk about sex in marriage. And, and so uh, now some of you are also sitting here going, great, I came to a marriage or family series and I'm single, so it doesn't apply to me. And, and if you're single, single again, widowed, uh, you're not in a relationship, then please understand that the Word of God, when it talks about relationships, uh, it, it talks very broadly. Our relationship with God, our relationship with others. And so there's principles that are going to apply to you. In fact, about 80% of the message is applicable to anybody, any place. There's some things that just apply to couples. And we'll talk about those and identify those. But if you're single, uh, this applies to you. And it applies to you if you ever think you might want to possibly be in a relationship someday. Because we're going to talk about God's plan and how he can bless you and how he wants to bless you if you'll listen to his word and to his way. So that being said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. You may be familiar with it. So do you believe that God created this world? Okay. I'm not going to qualify how or when or, uh, you know, that God created. I just want to establish that there's a creator, a designer, a planner, an initiator of our world. So do you believe that the God that you worship is the creator? Okay. So since your answer is yes, or at least some of you, uh, I want to share with you God's plan for intimacy. God's plan for intimacy. Because he's the one who created what is, and so we could learn from him as the creator. Uh, in fact, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are our creation narrative that they're informative for so much of our life. Genesis 1, God created, and it lets us know that he created, it was good, it was orderly, it was his plan, he was in charge, and in the end he created man and woman in his image. Chapter 2, Genesis 2, is a story of God creating relationship. So that God created Adam, and uh, the very first time God said something wasn't good was in Genesis chapter 2. Before there was sin in the world, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Guys, can I hear an amen there? Amen. I, I mean, because I am not good if I am alone. In fact, I just confess, I am pathetic by myself. And, and uh, you know, Marotta leaves town for the weekend, and I stay up too late, I eat junk, it's just not good. It's, I'm, I'm not, I, I need... Uh, I, I get that. Uh, so God says it's not good. The man should be alone. I'll make a helper for him. And then God brought all the animals to Adam, and he named them. And, but a helper or a, a, a mate was not suitable for him. So God created woman. And God brought Eve to Adam. And, and this is Adam's response. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That sounds so dignified, doesn't it? This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Oh, thank you, creator of all. You are so good. You know, it, it, the problem is we read the words and we don't really catch the emotion of them. I had a Hebrew professor who said, really, when you translate the Hebrew that is uh, at last bone of my bone and flesh, he goes, it really translates more to like, yes. <laughs> and then God declares... Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. God's plan for intimacy. Now, the next verse is really cool because it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Naked and not ashamed. See, God's design for intimacy from the beginning is one man and one woman joining their lives physically, relationally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually to the point where there is no shame and no fear. That, that's God's plan. 
It's two people committed to each other so that they can bless each other, raise a family together, protect each other, and celebrate and enjoy life together. Isn't that what we want? I don't know. Is that what you guys want? It's what I want. Do you want that for your kids? Do you want that for your grandkids? To have that kind of relationship? To be a couple enjoying love without fear? Think about this. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Think about that. Perfect love casts out fear. In other words, God's plan is that in our relationship, there would be no fear of being hurt. There would be no fear of being rejected or abandoned or abused. That in our godly relationships, there's no fear of betrayal or deceit or being put down. See, God's plan for intimacy is a relationship of mutual blessing and hope and joy. (laughs) And we have really messed that up. Haven't we? I mean, Genesis 3 happened. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They said, God, we're going to do it our way, not your way. And, And they listened to Satan. And their relationship with God was broken. And their relationship with each other became strained. And, and, and this dysfunction entered into the world, and the world changed, and the world became adversarial, and relationships became twisted and distorted as we lost sight of God's plan. Our vision of what relationships should be were distorted and twisted by sin. Um, when, I, when I wrote those words, I thought about carnival mirrors. Who likes carnival mirrors? Seriously, I'm the only one who likes carnival mirrors? I mean, I can spend like hours in front of carnival mirrors. You got to have a group of friends to make fun of and laugh with, but it's really great. Okay, a regular mirror shows you your image, and I know a lot of you don't like mirrors, period. But you never walk up to your mirror in your bathroom and go, you are twisted and distorted. Because that image is your image. It's what you look like, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, don't worry, you get a new body uh, one day, okay? So... So there it is. That's your image. But if you go to a carnival mirror, it takes your natural, real image, and it distorts it in really humorous ways, right? Your head gets really big. Your face gets long. You know, your, your feet get really short. Your legs get really short. Your body is long. It, it's just great. It's just, it, and we laugh because it's a distortion, and we know it. What's a tragedy is if we actually thought that's what we look like. See, in our world, we've distorted God's image of relationship, of intimacy. Uh, We've lost sight of God's design, and it shows in our culture. Think about it. Uh, In our culture, intimacy has become all about the physical, right? It's all all about the the physical aspect of it. Um, How ridiculous it is that we wear intimate apparel, as though garments that are worn for milliseconds will produce intimacy somehow. right? And yet there's a whole chain of stores that just, we sell intimate apparel. You see, we've twisted God's gift of sex. He gave it to us to unite husband and wife, and we've turned it into a game. We've turned it into a casual physical activity that where we pursue for pleasure and self-gratification instead of a sacred expression of love. And then we wonder why our relationships struggle. We wonder why our marriages fail, why we're not happy. So it comes back to the beginning. Do you believe that God is the creator? So do you? Do you believe that God has a plan for intimacy that will bless you and your relationship? Okay, don't answer this next one out loud, okay? If you've answered yes to those, then will you listen to the counsel of God? Because God wants to teach us how to be intimate and how to be a a couple that is filled with joy, how to have a relationship that is a blessing. But it begins when we confront the lies of our culture. And I want to talk about what I think is the first big relationship lie that so many of us have bought into. Because that's what Satan does. Satan takes the the truth of God and he twists it and and he warps it so that we don't see reality. And when we buy into that warped image, it leads us to destruction. So here's the first lie that I think Satan tells us uh, about sex, about intimacy. And it sounds so romantic. I mean, they make movies off this premise and they write books and people buy and that kind of stuff. So the lie that comes from the world, uh, it's this. 
You have a soulmate. You have a soulmate, and if you find that right person, they will complete you. And they will make you blissfully happy, and you will experience true love. Now, think about this. If that's true, then your happiness and your love is dependent upon a lifelong game of hide-and-seek or where's Waldo. (laughs) Because you're spending all of your life and all of your energy trying to find the right person. And what if you choose the wrong person when you think they're the right person because they lied to you? And, And here's the even dumber part. What happens if your soulmate decides not to wait to be found by you and they pick somebody else in the meantime? And you're just kind of left there, I, my soulmate already is married, so I'm, I, I failed. I have to live a life miserable and alone. And see, you know, the danger in that is this. If you're in a relationship and it's not working out, then you can just pull the whole soulmate card and blame them. Oh, the problem is you. Because you're not my soulmate. You don't understand me. You don't complete me. I chose poorly, and so now I'm going to blame you, and I'm going to walk away from this relationship, and I'm going to go back and join the game of Where's Waldo Part 2, because apparently you're not my soulmate. And it it allows you to not take any responsibility for your actions in the relationship. But what God says is this. He says, commit to a person. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there are two biblical requirements for that person that you pick. One, opposite gender. Two, person of faith. That's it. God says commit to a person and then love and serve them in Jesus' name. And as you do this, then intimacy will grow and you will discover joy and satisfaction. In other words, your happiness and your love is primarily dependent upon your actions and your choices. But the challenge is this. How are we going to think about our relationship? If you want God's blessings of intimacy in your relationship, then you got to pursue it God's way because God has a plan for intimacy. He's the designer. He's the creator. He built the world. He put it together. He made us to be sexual beings. It's his idea. Do we want to do it his way? Now, if you follow God's plan for intimacy... And if you want to to experience his best, then I'm going to share with you two steps, two actions today that that will help to improve your intimacy. Now, these are not easy steps. These are not easy actions. These These are biblical principles that we need to embrace, but they're going to challenge the patterns of your relationship. They're going to challenge the attitudes you have about relationship. So if you say, yes, God, I want to do it your way, then we're going to give you a couple of of things, and I'm going to have homework with these, okay? I'm just telling you right now. And, and, And if you'll take this and you'll pursue it, then God will start blessing and changing your relationship. And, And if you don't, then you can go on and see how that works out your own way. So here we go. Step number one, if you want to improve your intimacy, rejoice in your spouse. Rejoice in your spouse. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Here's what Solomon, the wisest man in the world, wrote to his kids. He said, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Isn't that cool? Be intoxicated always in her love. Some of you are like, the Bible says this stuff? I didn't know they had good stuff in there. I'm going to read more of it. That's a good idea. Good good idea. Read more of it. See, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 is primarily about the destruction of unfaithfulness. And in the midst of it, Solomon says, hey, guys, if you want to be wise, then rejoice in your spouse. Delight in her or in him. Because if you delight in someone who's not your spouse, Solomon says, then you're an idiot. (laughs) That's what the word fool means, okay? You're an idiot, and it's going to lead to pain and sorrow and death. And and by the way, if you have idiot tendencies, read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. It's a great antidote because it'll tell you what's going to happen. And if you've been an idiot and you're going, okay, what chances do I have to recover? Understand God's grace abounds to us. And our God is a God who redeems. 
Our God is a God who forgives, and he can restore your life and your relationships, and he can heal you and move you forward. But rejoice in your mate. It should be easy to rejoice in our spouse. After all, we chose them, right? I mean, you're the one who made the choice. In fact, you spent a lot of money, or somebody did, for you to declare that choice, right? You gathered a whole bunch of people together. You bought an expensive dress. You wore an expensive tux. You stood in front of crowds of people, and you said, this is the person I'm going to rejoice in. It was such a big day, you decided to humiliate your friends with you, (laughs) right? Because, guys, you made your buddies rent tuxes and stand up there all uncomfortable in shoes that weren't theirs. And ladies... You made your best friend spend lots of money on ugly dresses. <laughs> on the day that you looked the best in your whole life, you made them look hideous, and that's because they're your friends. I don't get this, but you wanted to make sure that the important people were there for you to say, this person I delight in. And you did it for that day, and the problem is we don't do it for the rest. And God says, rejoice in your spouse every day. Every day. Here's a challenge I want to I give to you. Um, make it a daily decision to rejoice for your spouse and, and start doing this. Start praying uh, a, a very short prayer, very simple prayer, and, and every one of you can do this. Uh, God, thank you for my spouse. Uh, you can actually use their name. I just thought it'd be weird to tell you, God, thank you for Merelda, because some of you might go home and start praying that, and that would be really awkward. <laughs> okay? Um, thank you for my spouse. And the second statement, God, help me to love them like you created me to love them. Very simple. Ask God to do that. First thing in the morning, it'll, it'll start to change that dynamic as you rejoice in your spouse because the temptation is to rejoice in someone else. Uh, again, Satan wants to destroy our lives, our families, and, and the temptation is comparison. So guys... Stop looking at porn. I mean, your wife cannot compete with false images of online fantasy. And guys, stop comparing your wife to other women. Stop looking at somebody else's wife or somebody in your office or somebody at work or somebody you hang out with and and, and thinking, wow, they're so much better than my wife. Because, you know, here's the reality is you don't know them. I, I mean, they look good from a distance. But you get up close, you start living with them, and it's going to all change. See, the truth is this, you you might become enamored with some other woman and you think she's beautiful and she's funny, she's encouraging, she's playful, she's smart. My wife isn't those things. And and so you think, I found the perfect woman, my soulmate, found her. (laughs) And I promise you that somewhere there is a man who is thanking God that she is no longer in his life. So rejoice in the wife of your youth and you will be blessed. Ladies, stop looking at porn. You know, surveys say that, especially uh, among women under 40, that up to 50% struggle with pornography, or regular online uh, porn users too. So stop looking at porn. And ladies, stop complaining about your husband. He's not romantic like so-and-so. He doesn't help out around the house. He doesn't make enough money. You're too fat. You lose weight too fast. You're no fun. Just stop. Whatever the complaints are, because when you complain about your husband, you push him away. You push him away. You destroy intimacy. You say that you want intimacy in the relationship, but when you're complaining, you're pushing him away. You are not, please hear this, you are not inspiring him to change in your complaints. Um, what you're really telling him is that you want him to leave, that you don't want him around. Ladies, if you really want to see your husband change and grow in intimacy, then delight in who he is. Encourage him verbally. Celebrate his successes, his accomplishments, his character. Let him know that you rejoice in him, and you will be amazed at how the relationship grows and how he changes in ways that surprise you. So if you want to follow God's plan to intimacy, then rejoice in your spouse. Secondly, protect your marriage. Protect your marriage. I'm going to encourage you to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 
If you've got a Bible like mine, it's really easy. It's page 1,214. Protect your marriage. The Apostle Paul wrote this, and the Apostle Paul uh, was single, and he wanted everybody who loved Jesus to be single so that we could all serve God with, uh, like, crazy and not be distracted by family and stuff. But he's writing to the church in Corinth. He's writing to Christians, and here's what he says to them, uh, kind of in a begrudging way, but, but he wants us to protect our marriages. Chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says, Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I don't know if you really heard that, but what do you think the, the primary message that, that Paul is telling the Christian couples in this church to do? See, people, they're laughing. They don't even want to say it. Somebody finally just whispered it kind of over here. Yeah, he's telling them to have sex, isn't he? Isn't that, isn't that what he's saying? Here, let me read this again with, I think, what, what the emphasis that Paul really wanted to write, but, you know, he knew it'd be Scripture someday, so he couldn't put it down, That's this black and white. Pick up verse 2. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Have sex. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. Have sex. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Have sex. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Have sex. (laughs) Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Have sex. Do not deprive one another. Have sex. (laughs) Except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again. Have sex. So that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You see, we live in a fallen world that has been distorted by sin. And the temptation to be immoral is everywhere, whether you are married or single. I mean, if we're trying to have faithful biblical marriages in a tender, Ashley Madison, Match.com hookup culture, right? I mean, they got all kinds of crazy, uh, you know, ways to connect with people. They got one for senior adults. Ooh. Uh, they've got... Uh, and, I, and I, I qualify now because I'm old enough, all right? It's weird. I mean, they've got a ChristianMingle.com. I mean, is that just wrong or what? I mean, is this a Christian hookup site? Uh, it just it seems unbiblical. Or FarmersOnly.com. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that, but that is a bad idea. You see, we, we know that we live in a society that encourages immorality and actually assumes immorality. They, they just assume, ah, oh, you're going to be, it's, it's going to happen, it's just part of life. Because if you watch TV, if you go to movies, you just see that as just part of the whole. And into that, the Apostle Paul, who really encourages singleness, says, protect your marriage. Protect it by enjoying God's gift of sex abundantly. Now, I know some of you guys have just today discovered that Scripture is really cool. (laughs) And you've become fixated on the first half of verse 4. Because you're like, hey, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does? I like this verse. I like the Bible. This is cool. But guys, you can't abuse this. Trust me, you can't abuse this this passage because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I'm going to go home and say, honey, um, your body wants to have sex. (laughs) Because guys, she'll answer, uh, I read the rest of the verse and your body's not in the mood. Um. You see, the message is not about power. It's not about control. It's not about demand. It's about intimacy. It's about valuing the relationship more than you value yourself. 
You see that, that whole deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me? That, that whole do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit? Th- those apply to our marriages. And when we approach intimacy with this, this understanding that, hey, I want to bless you and you want to bless me. and We want to take care of the marriage because we're one flesh and we're united in this. This is God's plan. And, and then you start caring more about your spouse than getting your way. And that changes the dynamic of the relationship. But guys, that means that you should never demand or threaten or force or manipulate for sex. You should be sensitive to your wife's needs and desires. Women, that means that you should never deny selfishly or use sex to manipulate or control. You see, being physically intimate is healthy for your marriage. Think about this. It brings us back to that place in paradise where we were naked and unashamed. Honoring God with your love expressed toward one another. Now, we live in a fallen world and we fight over intimacy. You saw it on Brandon and Julie's video testimony just a few minutes ago. Uh, last week, if you were here, you heard Meralda and I share that that was a point of conflict in our marriage as well. And so how do we deal with this when there's differing levels of sexual appetite within the relationship? Well, I think you talk about it and you agree on a number. Yeah, just... I'm just telling you. It, it, hey, when we first got married, uh, I, I really, I just confess, I, I grew up in a family of all guys. I really didn't understand women. And so I thought, hey, you know, now we're married. Uh, every time both of us have our clothes off, it's go time. <laughs> and and Meralda didn't feel the same way. Uh, surprisingly to me, you know, she kept talking about things like mood. I didn't get it, so, you know, I had to learn. And so it was a point of tension and conflict in our lives for for a number of years, and then finally I just go, hey, you know what, we can settle, let's just sit down and let's talk about expectations and desires, and and we agreed on a compromise, on on something that, that, that blessed both of us, that allowed us to enjoy each other, and it took all the pressure out of expectations. It really was, was healing for our relationship. And you go, well, that's not very romantic. Well, neither is fighting like cats and dogs. Neither is being frustrated. Neither is, is expressing your, your anger towards one another because your expectations aren't met. And, and so it was very healing to us. Develop a plan so that both of you can protect and build the relationship in love. Now, i got a closing challenge for you. Uh, For every person, first of all, and then for every couple. For every person, I want to challenge you this week to have a date with God. I I know that might sound a little strange, but a date is really just an intentional time and place. Right? You're going to have a date with somebody, you're going to meet them at a time and a place. And and so I want you to have a date with God. And I want you to have a conversation with God. And really, if you're married, I want you to ask God this question. Am I rejoicing in my spouse? Am I rejoicing in my spouse? And if not, then God's going to tell you and you can start making some changes. If you're single, then ask God this question. Am I embracing your plan for relationships or am I trying to do it my way? Whose path to happiness are you trying to follow? Because only one will actually get you there. Challenge for every couple. Have a date night this week. Go someplace together, be alone together, and, and while you're together, have a conversation. I, and this is going to sound really difficult for some of you, and, and yet uh, take you places you've never been. Ask your spouse this question, are you satisfied with our physical intimacy? You might go, that's a little bit risky, but here's the thing. It'll start a conversation where you put the relationship more important than your own desires and your own needs, and it'll start you on this path to health. And as you finish that date night, Pray for each other. Out loud. I know some of you are like, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Two-sentence prayer. I already taught it to you. God, thank you for my spouse. God, help me to love her the way that you created me to love her. You can do it. I can do it. We can change our relationships. We can bring them to that place where our lives conform to God's plan for intimacy. And we'll be blessed Our partners will be blessed, our kids will be blessed, and God will work in your families. Let's pray. God, thank you for your gifts that you give us. 
gifts of life and love, the gift of family, the gift of sex, the gift of grace that you've provided us in Jesus Christ. God, we want to honor you with all of our gifts. We want, we want you to lead us into truth so that we can live lives that are powerful, that are pure, that are honoring to you. But God, we confess that we need you. We can't do this without your help, without you teaching us what it looks like to love one another and forgive one another and grow together. So I pray for every couple in this room, every family that's represented here, that you would bless them with your presence and your power on their families today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.